is Danny Nierenberg, and I'm president of Food Tank. Food Tank has a really simple mission. We really work to highlight stories of hope and success in food and agriculture systems, both internationally and domestically. And that kind of storytelling includes the types of legislation and laws that we'll be talking about today. It is my sincere honor to welcome you all to today's discussion on fighting food waste through the bipartisan Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act. The Bill Emerson uh, Good Samaritan Act of 1996 paved the way for companies to donate their excess food, but it's in need of some really crucial and important updates. And while it's certainly not a silver bullet solution to end uh, food insecurity or food waste, Entirely, the proposed changes outlined in the Bipartisan Food Donation Improvement Act of 2021 are essential to strengthen the original intent of the legislation and also providing critical guidance and protection to increase food donations. As many of you know, food waste is one of the biggest environmental and social challenges of our time. At least 40% of all food goes to waste globally. And according to recent global research, that is about 2.5 billion tons of food grown annually that never gets eaten. This year in the United States, $408 billion will be spent processing, transporting, storing, and disposing of food that will not end up in people's stomachs. And this is according to our friends at the organization Refred. That's 24% of all food in the U.S. going to waste, which is so confounding and, and confusing uh, to me and all of us who really value food and all that goes into it. At the same time, the number of hungry people around the globe stands at roughly 881 million people. And the COVID-19 pandemic and its many variants has not only increased pressure on food banks and nonprofit organizations who work to recover and redistribute food to those in need. So this is an issue, again, that is not only an environmental problem, but a social and moral conundrum. As I mentioned, the Bill Emerson, the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act is designed to encourage companies to donate their surplus food and grocery products to nonprofits by providing civil and criminal liability protection for food, in, for food donation. But in order for it to be effective, for it to actually work, it needs to be expanded and clarified. And, and many organizations and policymakers, thankfully, have been working toward this goal, and, and I'm really inspired by them. For example, after hearing about this legislation, WW International tapped into their recently founded Healthy Living Coalition, which is a group of business leaders, nonprofits, and advocates who are fighting food insecurity. And they hope to galvanize support and awareness, which are crucial for the legislation to be effective. So in partnership with the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic, WW International and the coalition have gathered 28 cross-sector organizations who are combining forces, they're really activating and becoming superheroes to bring this issue to light. And it's really an incredible effort. At the same time, Senators Richard Blumenthal, a Democrat from Connecticut, and Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania, who's a Republican, have introduced the Food Donation Act of, uh, Improvement Act of, of 2021, which I mentioned before. And that's been introduced in the Senate. And it encompasses many of the necessary amendments to the Emerson Act, and, and we'll discuss a lot about that today. And just this week, uh, Representatives Jim McGovern, who is a Democrat from Massachusetts, Shelley Pingree, a Democrat from Maine, Dan Newhouse, a Republican from Washington, and Jackie Walorski, a Republican from Indiana, introduced the Food Donation Improvement Act in the House. It's exciting, at least to me, that there's all this bipartisan support for improvements to the legislation. And again, this is really common sense legislation and will go a long way in making sure that we keep perfectly delicious and healthy food out of landfills and that folks in need have an easier time getting access to that food. But we need all of you to be part of this. Everyone listening today is needed to carry this bill across the finish line. And, and, and you know, this is really something we can all do together and, and, and really play a role in fighting food waste and food insecurity. So I'm excited to kick off today's discussions by talking with Mindy Grossman, the CEO of WW International, who has been helping lead this effort. So Mindy, it's so great to see you. I want you, if you could, there you are. Uh, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I want to start off by asking you, 
why did OWW International get involved in this issue? Why was it important to you? Yeah, thank you, Danny, and thanks to this group and everyone that's joining today, because as you say, this is really a critical issue that we're facing even more critical today than ever before. You know, at WW, we had come out and said, we are going to be the brand that really focuses on democratizing wellness for all. People, families, communities, the world, for everyone. And as part of that, in October of 2020, we launched the Healthy Living Coalition, a very powerful and diverse group of many businesses out of the public, private, not-for-profit, um, and advocacy sectors, and really to use the combined resources around advocacy, action, investment, and impact to tackle the nutrition gaps and help improve food systems and be part of combating this issue of food insecurity. And certainly um, that has just increased. You came out with the statistics that we're, we're all aware of. Sure. Um, so to be able to take this Healthy Living Coalition and then I was introduced to the Emerson Act and what we could do to evolve it forward to create so many bigger opportunities to give people access to healthy food. Um, and so we said, how can we galvanize the businesses and even more that we already have to create a powerful movement forward to get this done? Absolutely. And I love two things that you said. One, I, this idea of, of really democratizing wellness. And two, that co coalitions and collaboration are so needed for this legislation to evolve. And, and, you know, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the existing uh, Bill Emerson Good Samaritan uh, Food Donation Act. You know, where does it help uh, address food waste and, 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 and food insecurity? And where is it falling short? And why is new legislation needed? Right. Well, certainly it was designed to make it easier for and to encourage companies to donate surplus food. I mean, obviously, that, that, that's core, especially to nonprofits. Um, and it does provide a certain level of liability protection. However, it definitely has some issues. Um, the legislation is not totally clear and it doesn't clearly outline how and what foods can be safely uh, donated. It's also never been contested. And mm -hmm. a lot of food manufacturers and uh, retailers, farmers, restaurants, people who could really be contributing so much more say the fear of liability is what is not galvanizing them to do what they really can do. Um, and so we have all of this high quality food, instead of going to people who need it through the right supply chain, it's going to waste. And we're still incurring the cost of that supply chain. So this is a double opportunity for us not to actually provide more food, but to actually create efficiencies while doing so. And, and these, you know, I, I was so impressed that WW International, again, built a coalition and then is encouraging 25, more than 25 other companies and nonprofits uh, through an open letter to call on Congress to remove the barriers that you've been talking about. Uh, and, and, and what changes do you want to see, you know, in this new legislation, the Food Donation Improvement Act of 2021? What, what specifically will really help companies and others to, to make the changes that you think are necessary? Yeah, Danny, as you said, that group is growing every day, which we're really pleased about. But in the letter, we really talked about three main changes. Um, the first is clarify. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, no uncertainty. Let's just clarify the terms and conditions and not to have any fear of retribution. The second is to broaden the protections, which I think we need to solve for to get more types of food don donations. Um, and then the third is to expand the federal uh, enhanced tax deduction for food donation. So this Food Donation Act that we're talking about today, very much addresses these first two issues of the three requests. And that's a huge win and we need that starting point. Um, and if passed, we know it will reduce food waste and it's a critical step to 
helping us all have the impact that we want to have, particularly in an environment where it's more critical than ever. Absolutely, absolutely. And as I mentioned, you know, throughout my introduction, I'm impressed and, and excited that this is a bipartisan issue. And you have said that this is not, you know, something that you sh think should be so polarizing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Expand on that? Sure. You know, having, you know, been involved in a lot of of things in Washington and with a lot of different things, I'm, I'm very comfortable saying this is not a polarizing issue. This is something where we can all come together to have a combined philosophy of what our impact could be. And I think that is what's so important. Um, we just want to put good food on people's plates um, and help with the food insecurity issues that we have today. And coming from an organization that's been transforming lives for almost 60 years um, through healthy habit formation and, you know, nutrition is the key unlock to what we have to do to help people lead healthier lives. So if we can bring the communities together to affect that, it's going to be very powerful. Absolutely. And before we turn to our next panel, Mindy, I, I'm wondering, you know, from my perspective, WW International is so well positioned to advocate for the policy changes that are needed. How can other companies sort of follow your lead in this and, and really shifting what public policy looks like on these really important social and environmental issues? Yeah. So to your point, community has been at the core of everything we've done from the very beginning, but there isn't a business or a brand out there that today doesn't have to think the same way about their communi communities and how they have to advocate local and national and what they have to be able to do to make progress. Um, and I think in today's environment, it's almost a brand prerequisite for looking to impact powerful communities to come together to help one another solve problems that we have. And that's the voice that we want to have. That's why we're bringing uh, like-minded organizations and individuals together to be able to affect change. Absolutely. So well said. Companies have a real role to play and they have a real responsibility to do so. Mindy, thank you so much for your leadership and for your enthusiasm and your passion in creating this network to, to really change things for the better. Yeah. Well, thank you for, uh, helping lead this today, I think we're all going to see a great outcome. Thank you so much. It's now my pleasure, um, and Mindy, if you, you can go off camera if you'd like, uh, to invite one of my favorite uh, food journalists uh, to join us, and that's Tim Carmen. If you could go ahead and turn on your camera. Hey, Tim. So hey, Danny. Tim is, is such an incredible reporter and writer. He is the food reporter uh, at the Washington Post, where he has worked since 2010. Before joining the Post, he served for five years as food editor and columnist at Washington City Paper, which I read religiously. <laughs> He's also a three-time nominee for a James Beard Award and the winner of a James Beard Award in 2011 for food-related columns and commentary. He will have a discussion with representatives Shelley Pingree from Maine and Representative uh, Sh Jim McGovern from Massachusetts, who are really warriors. I mentioned the superhero term before, but they are real warriors in the in the fight against food waste. Um, and this conversation with uh, Tim and, and the representatives will be file, followed by a panel discussion with other experts on the importance of legislation. So representatives Pingree and McGovern, if you wanna go ahead and turn on your cameras and join Tim, thank you so much. Over to you, Tim. Great, uh, thank you. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, representatives, the, the, this act came into law well before both of you were even in Congress. Uh, in 1996, as uh, you know, Mindy gave us a good overview of it, uh, but, but you've been dealing with the consequences of it and its limitations. And I wanted to get sort of a big picture from, you know, either one of you or both of you on, you know, what do you hear from your constituents or the companies, uh, you know, in your districts about where the, the act falls short? 
You want you want to pick? You, I'll let you go, Jim. You, 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 you got to pick one of us, otherwise we're just going to look. Yeah, Jim goes first. Jim goes first. Okay, right. I, I right. learned my first lesson. All right. uh, I'll, I'll go with. Uh, uh, let's go with uh, Congressman McGovern. You, why don't you start us? All right. Well, thank you, and I'm happy to be here with you, Tim, and 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 my one of my heroes, Shelley Pingree. And I want to thank um, Food Tank and WW International for doing this. Look, I mean, I I talk to a lot of people who worry about liability issues. Uh, they you know they they want. They say they want to be more generous. They want to provide more food to people uh, and to organizations, but they worry about the lack of clarity um, and the possibility uh, that they might be subject to a lawsuit. Um, and so they say that that's one of the disincentives. I mean, I come to this issue because I care very deeply about hunger and food insecurity. Uh, and I want to, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing for this White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger to try to look at the issue more holistically. And um, while this is not the total answer to everything, we ought to make it easier to get uh, to make to have restaurants and farmers and grocery stores to be able to donate good, healthy food uh, for people rather than throw it into a landfill or, or see it wasted. Uh, and so uh, so this offers clarity and I hope it will make it easier uh, for more and more people to donate. I want, I want to circle back to that point in a minute, but I want to give uh, Representative uh, Pingree a chance to just talk about the pandemic. I mean, we've been dealing with this for, what, 20 months now, and it's uh, it doesn't look like it's going to go away anytime soon. And this has obviously affected multiple uh, channels and, and food hunger. And I wanted to, to get your take on how has the pandemic affected food hunger, uh, supply lines, and if there's any way that amendments to the Emerson Act will uh, help in this on this front. Sure. Um, and again, I, I, I echo uh, Representative McGovern has done really incredible work on this, and his focus on hunger is uh, second to none. And thank you so much to WW International and Food Tank, because it's great to bring people together and really appreciate everybody who's listening today and uh, we can use all of your help in working forward on these issues. I've taken a very comprehensive look at food waste and I've been working on this for a few years from the agriculture perspective, um, the hunger perspective, the environmental issues related to wasting our food. And I found that you have to break it down into chunks because we can't deal with everything at the same time, you know, more composting site, less waste at schools, you know, all the things. And this is a really important piece as uh, people have mentioned, in dealing with the liability issues, whether it's a restaurant not sure which food they can donate and which not, a retail store, a farmer who has uh, extra supply in the field, we need to get all of that to hungry people and we need to make sure that people know they're fine with doing it. Now, there's nothing good about the pandemic, but if there was a silver lining, one of them was that it really helped people to understand the complications of our supply chain and our food supply chain in particular. It's uh, what people call bifurcated. You know, we had a very strong supply chain that went to food services and restaurants. And as we know, restaurants were closed for a very long time. And then suddenly all that food that was directed in that direction um, couldn't find its way into retail stores. So you'd see empty shelves. And at the same time, you'd be watching TV and you'd see people um, plowing under, you know, acres of fields of onions and zucchinis. And unfortunately, slaughtering a lot of animals that couldn't get to the slaughterhouse because um, we had a pandemic in some of our largest slaughterhouses in America because we're over consolidated. And that's a whole nother issue too. But the fact is, it's really focused people on this fact that sometimes there's plenty of food out there. We're a food rich nation, but we had um, extremes in hunger during the pandemic. People who couldn't um, get to food, they weren't going to work, they didn't have their job or it wasn't in the grocery store. And we had unprecedented lines at um, food banks. Uh, we had to increase the amount of um, SNAP benefits that make it more available to people. Kids weren't going to school, so they didn't have feeding programs, lunch or breakfast or the things that they were used to. And the good part of that, the reason there's a somewhat of a silver lining, is it really helped people to understand that food waste isn't just something like your grandmother said, don't waste your food, you know, a, a small matter. This is a massive issue in our country, and we have to deal with it on all fronts. And, and this is one really important way to go about doing that. So you both brought up the, the term liability, and I, I'd like to dig into that a little bit more if we can. Like, I, I sense that one of the issues for whether it's a, a, a large you know, company like a, a grocery chain or a small restaurant, 
that wants to donate food, that the terms of the current act are just too vague. And there's been no sort of definition for them. And I wondered, like this, the amendments here are, are going to, I'm assuming they're going to try to put some clarification or at least put some people in place to try to clarify that. And uh, Congresswoman Pingree, I don't know if, if you've got some insights on that, on on whether or not the the amendments to the act will give more definitions or at least a chance for more definitions. Well, um, it certainly is a start. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot more that we have to do. We've, we've been trying to get, um, you know, really just an agency connected with this or some individuals that um, if you have a business or you're a farmer, you can go to to make sure there is clarification. But, you know, food is a perishable item and we have all kinds of food safety standards. So um, whether you're a grower of food or you're a retailer of food, you're going to worry about, wait, if I give all this food to, uh, you know, to a food bank or some other entity, um, um, you know, what, what will my liability do? What if they don't handle it right? What, what could go wrong along the way? And that has often led grocery stores. We've talked to entire chains of grocery stores who say, we're more comfortable throwing everything in the dumpster right. than trying to figure out, you know, where this goes and where that goes. Well, we have food banks that are desperate to distribute more food. So this is one way to make sure that um, some of those liability protections are clear and that we make sure that, um, you know, that everybody who can donate is donating and it's a, it's a secure chain to do that. Um, one other thing I'd mention is I've done a lot of work on a, a different bill that's related to food date labeling. Um, we have completely arbitrary date labeling in this country. Mm -hmm. When you pick up a can, you know, you see that date. It, it doesn't really um, fit to a federal standard. The only thing that's actually regulated is infant formula. So without those standards, if you see something that has the wrong date and it goes on the shelf at a food bank, it may be perfectly good to eat. You know, if it's in your pantry, it's still perfectly good to eat. Mm -hmm. But people worry about, well, what if I'm a retail store and I donate that and the date isn't and the people think it's not safe? You know, how do we clarify all these things? This doesn't fix everything there, but it helps us to deal with one of the more complex issues of why we throw away food. I, I, you you took a question right out of my mouth about the the because I, I understood that you are a, a sponsor of the Food Date Labeling Act. And this is a really important point because it, like you may have a sell by date on on an item or a best by date. But these are not these are not expiration dates on the quality of the product. And I think when you've got terms in the Emerson Act that say, you know, you have to have, you know, a wholesome product or that it needs to adhere to all the labels, federal and state and local, that must put the fear of God into a lot of, of these potential donors. And Representative McGovern, I wonder if like that has ever come up with some of the people you've spoken to, like these labels in, them, in and of themselves become a problem for food donations. They do, and I hear it all the time. And as Shelley points out, the bill that we're talking about would clarify labeling standards that uh, f food products must meet to to be eligible, uh, you know, for for liability protections. But the lack of clarity, um, you know, opens up, opens up more uncertainty, uh, and so people you know, would like to do uh, more donations, but you know, they worry about these, you know, Best Buy dates, for example. Uh, and the problem is uh, that it becomes more convenient and less worrisome to throw that food in the dumpster. I mean, a couple of years ago, um, I, I went to the uh, the back parking lot of a, of a major grocery chain in my district and started looking through the dumpster. And I saw, you know, lots and lots of great food that was perfectly fine, but was being thrown away. I got chased out of the parking lot. They thought, I don't know what they thought I was doing there. But anyway, but I just wanted to see for myself, um, you know, what was being discarded. Uh, and um, so I, again, let's make this as easy as possible. And I just wanted to say one other thing. You know, we you, we, you know, we you referenced the the pandemic. Um, understand this this was this was a problem even before the pandemic, and um, why the, we saw hunger exacerbated during the pandemic. Before the pandemic, we had like thirty five to thirty eight million of our fellow citizens who technically were hungry or food insecure. So this has been a problem for a long time. It's just that the the pandemic has shined a light on the disparities and the inequities and the uh, and the and the problems within our, our supply chain system. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to this is like a, a, a first this, this will help clarify things. And I think it will make uh, more food available uh, for distribution, which is a good thing. 
And again, we are interested in not just any kind of food. Uh, we we, we want to make sure that people have access to good, nutritious food. We want to make sure that the donations uh, are the food that you and I and our families would want to eat uh, and not just, you know, what's remaining on the shelves. We want to make sure that we're emphasizing the importance of good, nutritious food. A good point. Um, and, I, you know, I think there's a, a constant drumbeat that the Emerson Act amendments are not necessarily going to be the silver bullet that ends hunger, but one step in a process. And, I, and Representative Pingree, could you like talk about some of the other elements here that really the Congress should look at in order to deal with this ongoing hunger crisis that we have? Sure. Well, it's it's a long list, um, and 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 often very contentious. And and uh, Congressman McGovern could tell you about the battle scars that that he has over the years of fighting over SNAP benefits and um, restrictions on who's allowed to get SNAP benefits. What we used to call food stamps um, availability. Who who can access them? Um, how much is in the allocation? Because it's it's frankly very small, and we've occasionally had challenges in Congress where we're all asked to eat on what a recipient would receive for SNAP benefits for a week, and you get pretty you know used to noodles and cans of soup because you know there's not a lot in there. So the allocation, um, and then um, school lunch programs, the whole issue related to, you know, food shaming at school and making sure that schools have access to, you know, some need to have breakfast, lunch, and after school programs or food in a backpack that kids take home or summer feeding programs. So so there is a lot that we work on and that we have to do. Um, and, you know, one of our focuses is related to getting more healthy food, as, as uh, Representative McGovern mentioned, um, because we want to make sure that families have access to healthy fruit and vegetables. We know how important that is. And one of the reasons that food waste is so critical is often what we're wasting is the very food you want people to access. A lot of it ends up, it's never harvested out of a farmer's field. It doesn't meet USDA regulations for grade A. So maybe two thirds of the peaches stay on the ground or a third of them, or the market isn't available or the supply chain is messed up. And so all of these things happen and we just need to have a successful channels to get those healthy foods into the hands of people who need them at an affordable price. Uh, so, you know, uh, Danny had mentioned that this, uh, these amendments to the act are it's like very much uh, bipartisan. What, what, are the, what are the chances that it's going to pass the house and Senate then get signed into law? I think good. Um, I, you know, I could, I, you know, I, I chair the rules committee. Uh, so we get to put decide very what powerful goes, committee. So we, we go to the floor. I, I guarantee you, we will move this forward uh, next week. Obviously, working with uh, Congresswoman Pingree because she has some some big a bigger bill, uh, and uh, and some of these ideas are included in that. But we're going to move this. Um, there's no there's no question about it. And um, and again, um, you know, going back to your question to to Shelley about other things that can be done. That's why we need a White House conference on food, nutrition, health, and hunger. I mean, we, we, I mean, there are a thousand things that we need to do. This is one of them. You know, I mean, she meant, Shelly mentioned about you know, getting fresh peaches into, into a classroom for kids to be able to enjoy. Well, you know what? We have schools in my district that don't have kitchens and don't have refrigeration. Infrastructure is an issue. Transportation is an issue. Our health systems are separated from uh, food and nutrition, which makes no sense to me. Um, you know, utility costs. Uh, you know, they, they cut into people's food budgets, housing. I mean, we go right down the list, but we need to look at these issues holistically. And this, what we're talking about here today, this bill is one piece of the puzzle uh, that we need to put in place uh, to, to, to effectively uh, not just manage hunger in this country. We ought, to, we ought to be talking about zero hunger. We ought to be talking about ending hunger. Uh, and uh, so let's make it easier uh, for people to donate uh, and for, uh, you know, uh, businesses to donate. And um, and I think we can get this done. And if we don't, then you can write a column and say that I failed. But I'm going to, I, I can I can pretty much guarantee you we're going to move this through the House. Great news. Uh, this is obviously a very important discussion, and we've just sort of skimmed the surface of it. But uh, I really thank you both, uh, Congresswoman Pingree, uh, Congressman McGovern, thank you for your insights into this and for your work in food recovery and food waste. Um, I think we're going to move into the second part of this. Um, yeah, I thank you both again. Sure.
Thanks. Uh, we, the second part of our panel is going to be focused on sort of people on the ground who, who deal with these uh, issues, uh, whether it's uh, you know, dealing with food recovery or the policy aspect of it, or those who uh, have food to contribute. So uh, let me introduce the, the panelists that we have for this next one. Uh, I have Emily Broad-Lieb, and she is, I have the title here, if you give me a second. Uh, she is the uh, clinical professor of law and the faculty director of the Harvard uh, Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic. And we also have Jenny Murphy, who is the senior director of the supply chain for a city harvest in New York City. I believe they cover all five boroughs. Um, and then finally, we have Stephen Jennings, who is uh, the lead of the stakeholder relations for a hold Del Hayes USA. Uh, welcome all. Is everybody off mute? Please take mutes off. Great, great. Thank you, Tim. So, um, Emily, I'd love to start with you. And you've been in this uh, policy field for a long time. And I think you've got probably the, the broadest perspective uh, on it. Uh, can you give us an overview of the Emerson Act and really its deficiencies uh, in these 20, what, 25 years now since it was enacted? Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's also, it's been great hearing the conversation so far. Um, so just, I think it's helpful to start with what I do. So I work alongside law students to help people understand the laws and to improve policies to make the food system healthier, more sustainable and more equitable. And one of the biggest areas of our work is really around reforming the laws and systems that lead to food waste. So as um, you know, we heard earlier about 35% of the food produced in the US goes to waste. Um, at the same time, about 10% of the US population experienced food insecurity last year. So a lot of our work is trying to figure out why, um, why that happens. Um, you know, often food goes to waste because businesses are afraid that even if they do everything right and follow all of the food safety laws and best practices, someone might get sick and come back to sue them. And so um, because of this, Congress in its brilliance in 1996 passed the Emerson Act, which is really a visionary law. It was the first law in the world of this kind and, you know, was, was really intended to get to the heart of this. Um, but I think as we've heard already, there's a couple challenges with the Emerson Act as it exists. I think probably the biggest that we've heard about is that there are a bunch of terms in the act. So it says, you know, companies will be protected if they donate apparently wholesome food. But then there's really no one you can go ask, is this, you know, ingredient that I've made apparently wholesome? What if there's a flaw in the labeling? Like, um, you know, we've heard of issues where the labeling was incorrect in terms of the weight of the product. So it's illegal to sell food that has the, lab the weight labeled incorrectly. But certainly if you're in need and hungry, it doesn't matter what the weight is, you're getting it for free. You're not gonna be defrauded by paying too much. So there's, I think that's one of the big issues. And then the other things um, that are kind of addressed by this act that modernize it are two big things. One is um, protecting donations by what are called qualified direct donors. So the idea here is that um, under the Emerson Act right now, a business is only protected if they give food to a nonprofit that then distributes it to people in need. And that is gonna be the typical way food gets donated. Uh, but often, you know, there's like a very small amount of leftover food. We hear this a lot from restaurants at the end of the night that there's no food bank open that they could take that food to. It's not even enough that most food organizations would want to recover it. So they, they, don't, they don't want to get sued, so they throw it away. Um, and the other place we hear this a lot is at schools who, uh, many schools, they know that their, their children and their families in their school community are in need. But to receive protection right now, they might need to send food to a food bank or nonprofit on the other side of town to then distribute it back to the very same families. 
Um, so this act would would you know make sure that that was also protected if if um, qualified donors like schools and farmers and food businesses gave it directly. And then the only other thing that it does is it says that as we're seeing innovation in the field of food donation, there's been lots of models that um, are requiring the food recovery organization to not only go collect food, but also to collect donations of money to pay for their equipment and staff. And this has also increased during COVID that um, a lot of volunteers that are older stopped working and people suddenly in food recovery organizations had a real staffing shortage. Um, so it would also protect if a nonprofit that received food sold it at a very low price. And this would allow some kind of creative um, nonprofit grocery stores and things like that. So I'll, I'll stop there. I know that was a lot, but it's pretty exciting, you know, to take this visionary law and just bring it forward into 2021. That is great. Thank you, Emily. Um, and I think it, it moves right into a question I wanted to ask Jenny. Um, there is, you know, you have like a minimum at City Harvest on the, the amount that your organization will pick up from any one donor. And that in itself can be an issue for some potential donors. And I, I, I get the sense that the, the change in the ability for people to donate directly would be a real help for these type of donors. And I wonder if you could just talk about sort of the logistic pro, logistical problems of you know, sometimes getting the food that is going to be unconsumed into the people that could actually use it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, so just um, to introduce City Harvest. Um, so we're New York City's first and largest food rescue organization. So since our founding, we've distributed over a billion pounds of food to the community. And since the pandemic started, um, we've distributed over 220 million pounds of food. Um, so like you mentioned, um, the nutritious component is really something we focus on. We distribute over 70% produce. Um, and with all of those things, the you know, being able to serve our community in the way that we need to, um, we have 23 trucks and tractor trailers on the road 24 hours a day. Um, but with that, we have to have a minimum of 100 pounds that we pick up in the five boroughs in New York City. Um, we have over 2,000 food donors that we work with every year, and we pick up almost 3,000 um, pounds, uh, 3,000 stops per day. Um, and just being able to function in that way, um, we have to have that minimum. Um, so just being able to connect to the community and distribute over 200,000 pounds of food a day is um, our goal. And working with over 400 um, different uh, food providers, um, also, you know, senior centers and aftercare centers for children, um, we, we are just trying to, to move as much as possible with what we can on our trucks. But I imagine, uh, Jenny, I'd like to follow up just a second. Like, there must be, you must get phone calls or, or emails, like, every day saying, or even late at night from a restaurant saying, you know what, we've got this leftover food and it's, you know, maybe 10 pounds, 20 pounds, but you can't use it. So it just gets tossed into the trash, but this would fix that. This would, this would give the ability of a, a smaller donation to maybe even just go right outside and, and, and distribute it itself. Exactly. And that's that's what Emily was alluding to in the um, additions to this act would be incredible to be able to refer our neighbors to their own neighbors and their own um, pantries and soup kitchens in their areas for, you know, the, the 10 pounds of food that they have or um, cleaning out um, their their pantries and being able to provide to their the soup kitchen down the street or or um, one of the aftercare centers. This would be really incredible to be able to support them to feed the community. Exactly, uh, Stephen. Now you um, you represent you know some some big companies, uh, Food Lion, uh, Giant, uh, both come to mind, <clears throat> large uh, grocery store chains. And I wonder if like some of the changes, uh, the amendments to the act, the proposed changes, like would they help um, some of these, uh, you know, grocery stores look at ways to maybe repurpose 
some of its food waste and be able to sell it at a, like a discounted rate to people who really need it? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So that's a loaded question, and there's a lot of things that go into that. So uh, we are the largest uh, grocery retailer on the East Coast, of comprised of five great local brands, some of which you mentioned, Tim, so thank you for that. And you know, as a grocery retailer, we have a heavy responsibility to, it breaks all of our hearts when we see food go into the trash. So we adopted the uh, EPA uh, food recovery hierarchy. So we obviously we're not a nonprofit, so we're trying to sell all the food that we can for sure. But our second priority is now to donate and, and feed our local communities. So local folks in our communities. And then thirdly, we then do more kind of leading down the path I think you're referring to. We do organic recycling or composting where we, in essence, feed animals. And then it starts going down to industrial uses, rendering, and then the, you know, the bottom of the pyramid, which would be the absolute worst scenario, will be sending food to landfill. So we have a, a mirror of goals to help reduce that food waste. So we've committed to 32% food waste reduction by 2025 and 50% by 2030. And we do that through a lot of ways. So one is working with great partners like Jenny at the great local food banks um, in which we operate. And that's how we started kind of this, this shift. It's not just enough to donate because we've donated packaged goods for, for since I've been with the company over 25 years. But we also know and recognize that packaged goods are not always the most nutritious or the healthiest of products. So we've been moving into some of our brands have been doing it for quite a few years, 10 plus. Some just started last year during the pandemic, but really focusing on fresh food recovery. So taking those more wholesome, fresh products that we're referring to in the Emerson Act and bringing that more accessible to folks in need in our local communities, right? So part of the challenges for us have been, and you know, we're a business, so again, we're in the business to sell food. So part of our fear with some of our leadership was simply the fact that there, there could be a potential PR risk. So we talk about that best buy and that sell by date, but some of us still have in our head expiration, expiration. And we know the language changed a long time ago, but a lot of folks still refer to it as an expiration date. So it's kind of getting past some of that. And then once we kind of get over that reward and risk, so the reward is that we're feeding folks right there. There are neighbors. One in four of our own neighbors have uh, tested positive, as we say, for food insecurity or have missed a meal in particular over the pandemic. So it's our role as a food retailer to get that fresh, wholesome food into their hands. And we do that through the process of working with Jenny and, and folks uh, within her area. And then we take out the risk. So the risk for us was food safety. We talked a little bit about cold chain. So we worked with our great local food banks to ensure that all pickup agents were food serve certified and that they fully understood um, proper cold chain. And that took some of the, if you will, the pressure of the potential PR risk off of our business. So we're super excited to say we started at, in one of our brands at only 3% donation and just in less than a year, we're already up at 20% of all waste has been donated to fresh food recovery. So we're really proud of that. Great. Um, Emily, I want to circle back to you about, uh, there's an issue that has been touched upon, but I, I don't think it really has been explained why it's been a, an issue that the Emerson Act was never assigned to a federal agency and, and what that has meant for its implementation or maybe the lack thereof. And what if you can give us an, uh, uh, an overview on that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I know it's come up a little. So it's it's very unusual. Usually when Congress enacts different legislation, they say, you know, the you know, Department of Agriculture will implement this or the Department of Health and Human Service will write regulations on that. And in this case, the Emerson Act is, you know, again, a very visionary bill. It's really great. It's quite short. It's about a page and a half if you were to print it out. Um, but there's a bunch of terms in there that aren't defined. And because there was nowhere in there where Congress said to any government agency, you know, write regulations or produce guidance on this, um, there's not really been any agency that's really taken kind of, you know, taken the reins of that. And that feels comfortable answering questions. 
And I think partly it's because these are very legal questions. So without Congress really saying to an agency, like you have the authority here, you know, I think the agencies feel really scared that they're not the ones with the authority to make interpretations. Um, we do a lot of work on kind of comparing laws on food donation and food waste around the globe. And there are a number of countries that are now passing laws like this to protect um, food donations. And this is very unusual. In most countries, there's a ministry that has been asked to, you know, answer questions, write guidance and flesh out the terms. So I think this is one of the pieces of this um, of this bill that I think would actually have the most impact. It would it would instruct USDA to um, explain the quality and labeling and safety provisions that need to be met by food. And kind of going back to Stephen's point too, I think like this question comes up all the time about food past the date. If the company knows that that date is about freshness and not safety, then you know, it'd be nice to have something from an agency saying that's enough to know that you're meeting the safety requirements and that that food is safe to um, to pass along. Exactly. Um, so believe it or not, we are already at the end of this discussion. And uh, it's a shame because I, I think there is there's so much more to talk about here. But I, I think we've We've, we've touched upon some important subjects. I just wanted to throw the final question out to everybody. Like when you look at the amendments to the act, the proposed amendments, like where do you see it making the most impact in your particular area? So I can add quickly. So one of the, one of the, um, the amendments were changing the word from, uh, to in good faith. So I think the example was apparently was like, what does that mean? Like, we, we have no idea. So language like that, like in good faith, um, really makes uh, larger retailers like us, as an example, um, really more comfortable in donating because we are doing it in good faith and it makes total sense um, to how we go to business. So that was very much appreciated um, from our perspective. Jenny, anything to add? Yeah, so obviously we're grateful for our food donors now um, and supporting food donors is essential for being able to provide for our community, but um, expanding tax deductions for them, uh, especially for our farmers um, and other corporations that, that really support us um, would be really helpful. And then uh, also just, um, you know, like we've talked about the expanding and clarifying those food safety terms um, Again, our, our staff are all trained in food safety um, and so are our agencies, but um, writing that in um, in a clarifying way would be very helpful. Thanks for bringing up the tax deductions. We didn't even really get to touch upon that very much. Uh, Emily, final thoughts. Yes, I'll say, so, you know, for me, our audience, you know, the my clients and partners are people like Jenny and people like Steven. So it's, we are, um, you know, at least once a week answering questions about this act and helping people try to figure out what Congress meant. And so I know the questions are out there. This would, I think, make it much easier that there's someone that businesses can go to and get answers and feel more comfortable donating. And I think it also helps give a refresh and raise awareness of, you know, this act passed so long ago before kind of our modern day experience with food and food waste and food security, um, particularly in light of the pandemic. So it would kind of give a refresh and remind everyone that we really want to make it the easy thing for businesses to do. Perfect. Uh, Emily, Jenny, Stephen, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and to bring it back full circle, let's uh, bring back uh, Danny and Mindy and let them wrap things up. Thank you so much, Tim. That was incredible. You really handled both of those panels so well. So much information uh, we covered in, in such a short period of time. And, and Mindy, you know, for me, it, it was such a, an interesting conversation in a, in a million different ways. We heard how the pandemic has really shined a light on, on disparities in the food system. Our representative Pingree, you know, mentioned how this is really one of the, the silver linings of the pandemic. And this is an issue, as, as we've heard, that is happening in all of our, our backyards. And it, it, it is really solvable. And the legislation can be a huge step and creating solutions that get fresh, healthy food uh, and other types of foods to folks. And um, 
And as Representative McGovern said, Mindy, that we have a real opportunity to change uh, things for the better. And I know you also believe that there is this huge opportunity, especially around collaboration and cooperation uh, for the private sector and nonprofits and others. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that spirit of collaboration that you've been creating with WW International. Absolutely, Danny. And I think this conversation today was not just powerful, but I think it clarified all the things that we discussed at the very beginning around what we need to do to take collective action together to provide a solution. And as Tim originally set up, the one step was the formation of the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act, but now it's time to take it forward. And I loved having the bigger vision um, that, you know, Representative McGovern said of zero hunger. And obviously there's a big gap. And to solve that gap, I think everybody that was on and is on today's call, if you take one thing away from today's event, one thing, and I know what we're trying to do at WW, we saw an opportunity And we went to convene, we went to advocate, we went to take action. And I think every company, every individual, every organization can do just that based on what they feel their impact to be. So we need all of the stakeholders to get involved, help us pass this Food Donation Improvement Act, but then even move it forward Mm -hmm. to enact further change. So I would urge everyone for that. I know we're galvanizing our community, our supporters, our Healthy Living Coalition, the other supporters around this act. And, you know, it does create a sea change if we all come together around a single initiative that is going to create great impact for humans. And that's what we need to be thinking about right now. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We really need all hands on deck. So thank you, Mindy, uh, so much again for your leadership on this issue and building the coalition and the collaboration that's needed to to move this act forward. I want to take this moment to thank all of our panel uh, panelists, our members of Congress and Tim Carmen for moderating such great discussions. And I also want to thank the online audience for being so involved in asking questions, some of them really difficult ones about how to solve food waste. One question that was asked by a participant that is so important is how we keep big corporations from throwing away perfectly good, nutritious, and tasty food in the trash. And again, that's that's something that, you know, makes no sense to most most of us watching uh, this this, uh, event today. And the Food Donation Improvement Act of 2021 offers such a simple and impactful way to help strengthen the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act and encourage the donation of nourishing and delicious foods to decrease food waste and its environmental and social implications. So, so much needs to be done, but again, this all hands on deck um, uh, idea, we need to move it forward. We can't do this alone. We need legislation and policy to make it easier. For those of you who are watching from congressional offices today, there will be a briefing document about the act coming soon. And please feel free to reach out to Senator Toomey and Blumenthal's offices for next steps on how to support the legislation. If you're a company looking to get involved in these advocacy efforts or wanting to start donating food, please reach out to Sona Jones at WW International. Her email is sona.jones, J-O-N-E-S at WW.com. And I think it will be dropped into the Zoom by my colleagues as well. For our audience members, and again, thank you for being such active citizens. As we said earlier, your support, your advocacy, and your activism is crucial. We urge you to spread the word far and wide about this issue at change.org slash Emerson Act. We will also be sending all of you who have registered to to the event an action plan for next steps uh, at the conclusion of today's discussion. And finally, as we head into the holiday season and the new year, when people unfortunately and and companies tend to to waste more food than usual, we need everyone to stand up and support the Food Donation Improvement Act of 2021 and to stop senseless food waste for for once and all. Um, I thank all of you for listening, learning and activating one another today. Happy holidays and here's to a 2022 where we don't waste food. Be safe, everyone.